welcome back everyone to another episode of Scrotus. This is uh, an unconventional episode, I guess, because I have been trying to work through the cases of the that the Supreme Court has heard this docket or this season, I should say, this session season session. I, I forgot the terminology they use. Um, I preferred season four; it was really well written. <laughs> this season is just like, who is writing this show? As soon as I said it, I knew it was wrong. Excuse me, this term, <laughs> this term of the Supreme Court. Um, I've usually been following a certain order of these co- of these cases and episodes we've covered, but this certain case is extremely important to our national politics, and um, so I figured I would fast track it to the front of the line, and it was uh, it's topical and something that is really important. So. It was heard, the oral argument for this case, which was Trump versus Anderson, was heard on February 7th. But this is the case uh, surrounding Colorado banning or removing, I guess guess is a better word, Trump from the Republican primary um, ballot. As we all know, uh, this happened in the Supreme Court of, of Colorado made this decision in December of 2023. And as soon as they did, uh, the Supreme Court basically said, ah, hold on a second. We'll, let, let us hear this argument and we'll make a decision. So any uh, any initial thoughts before I jump into the, the facts, Mr. Collin? I guess I would Dr. just say Colin. that yeah, Dr. Collin, Doc Brown, as I'm known, uh, I've been known to travel 88 miles an hour and go back to the future. Uh, <laughs> fighting that great time war over on Wandering Humanist. Check it out. Uh, I guess I would say that regardless of what, uh, despite my fighting the time war, I can't know what the future holds. Who can? But I will say that regardless of what the uh, the ruling, the outcome of this case is, it's going to be the biggest outcome you've ever heard. It's a good, And I know outcomes. I know rulings. This one's going to be, it's going to be bigly. So let's just let's just hit it. As I'm rolling my eyes, I <laughs> I will begin to get into the facts of the case, and I will preemptively say that this is going to be to sort of a two part discussion. I want to give the facts and talk about the conservative jurisprudential arguments that were made during the oral argument. Have a discussion about those. And the you know the Constitution and what it actually says, and then we'll shift to a a slightly different tact that I think is actually going to be the most influential in the decision that is uh, eventually written. So we'll sort of have two pieces of discussion um, as we as we continue. So as I said, this case was uh, put on the emergency docket of the Supreme Court, which is a big deal. Um, the current state of the Supreme Court, they have not put many cases on their emergency docket, meaning uh, cases that are sort of fast tracked to the front of the line um, because if, you know emergency needs. Uh, this doesn't happen as much anymore. It used to happen quite a bit, um, quite a bit more, but with the more conservative justices, they've sort of put a stop to some of that. So this is one that fell through the cracks, of course, uh, because it actually wasn't sort of an emergency. As I said earlier also, so uh, in September 2023, a group of eligible Republican primary voters solicited the Colorado Secretary of State to remove Trump from the primary ballot as he was apparently disqualified, per their argument, under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And I should note that the reason this case is called Trump v. Anderson is that Anderson was the spokesperson for this group of uh, Republican primary voters who first petitioned the Colorado Secretary of State. So, of course, with this petition uh, to the Secretary of State, Trump and his people sort of got involved and it went to court and became litigious. I'm kind of fast tracking a little bit because a lot obviously happened in a, in a very short amount of time. And I don't want to get into the weeds of some of that because we have a lot to sort of cover. So fast tracking a bit, a Denver district district court ruled that Trump did in fact participate in an insurrection. As we all know, everything that happened January 6th, uh, many 
on the left have decided to call that an insurrection. We quibble about the definition of that, and we'll talk about that later. Here's the thing. Okay, you ready? You want, you want my real take on it? Y- yes, but can we wait until we act? So it will come up. I, I was just going to say, Insurrection is one of the weakest of the Star Trek movies. Oh, jeez. I prefer, like, Wrath of Khan, but that's just me. Luckily, I've never seen any Star Trek movies, and I do not plan on it. So I, I'm not that kind of geek. All right. Continue. <laughs> tough crowd today. It is. It is. I'm. Well, I'm always a tough crowd. You are. Although the people listening probably probably uh, appreciate some of that more than I do. Anyway, uh, the district court in Denver ruled that Trump did in fact participate in an insurrection. Again, we'll discuss the kind of the definition of that in a, in a in a bit. But it's important to note that they did decide that he should not be disqualified. Since the president is neither considered, quote, an office of the United States, nor, quote, an officer of the United States. So that was the first ruling in the Denver District Court. It was appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court, and that's where it got the national news coverage uh, as they they made the decision that, yes, he participated in, in, in an insurrection and that, yes, the 14th Amendment does bar him from appearing on the ballot. So they made the final decision in December of 2023 to remove him from the ballot. That decision was, of course, stayed, as I mentioned earlier, by the Supreme Court when they agreed to hear the oral argument. If you will allow me to read Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, it is not long, but it is very important and the central central argument of the originalist live, point of view in this case. Live reading. We like live reading. It's all It's all the rage. It's hard to believe that this was written in like the 1800s because it's it's so legalese. But uh, oh, just bear that's with me for an a ancient minute. dialect, sir. <laughs> Section three of the Fourteenth Amendment says, and I quote: "No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state." who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature, legislature, excuse me, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But... Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. That is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment in in its entirety. And that language and verbiage will come up as, as I continue here. So, in the oral argument, Trump's counsel, who, by the way, had a last name of, has a last name of Mitchell, um, argued that the presidency is in fact not encompassed in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The key words he chose to focus on were office and officer. So elsewhere in the Constitution, it's made very clear that the president and officer are two separate titles. So uh, the Appointments Clause, the Commissions Clause, and the Impeachment Clause, three very separate and distinct parts of the Constitution, all three separately establish that the president is not an officer because each of these clauses lists president and, quote, officers of the United States as individual separate categories. They are not lumped together. Furthermore, the Constitution includes the oaths of these offices, and there is an oath taken by, quote, officers of the United States, which includes Congress members, and then it has a separate oath for the president. And each of these oaths uses very different language and verbiage for the the roles thereof. So this is the sort of textualist argument of why the 14th Amendment, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, does not apply to the office of the presidency. The counter arguments to this are probably quite obvious, right? So things like, why are we quibbling over 
the semantics of these words and trying to uh, guess what the framers and or original writers of the 14th Amendment might have meant by, by making these small distinctions that really are not steeped in history and don't have much uh, examples to, to either solidify or go against the, the differences. So this kind of textual argument is not, in my opinion, it's compelling because I like language and linguistics, but it doesn't seem to hold water probably. And I, I imagine you probably agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's interesting, but uh, not not the most persuasive. Now here's another side though. So Trump's side also argues about the definition of incitement and insurrection. So this is getting to uh, the conversation that I, I teased earlier. So Trump's counsel brings in a Supreme Court precedent. There's a case called Brandenver Brandenburg versus Ohio. And it stipulates that statements are not unconstitutional, un, uh, unconstitutional or incitement unless they are both directed and likely to produce imminent lawless action. So Trump's counsel is basically saying even if his statements contributed to an attack, he lacked the intent necessary to make those statements uh, an incitement of insurrection uh, and that they're constitutionally protected as free speech um, because he did not direct or intend to direct uh, an, an, an actual violent attack. The other side obviously rebuts this argument. And I, I believe in the actual oral, oral argument, they brought in a lot of um, dramatic stuff about how how scary everything was on January 6th and all of this, you know, rhetoric that, that they love to play up. Uh, but basically they, the, the other side rebuts the argument claiming that his speech and tweets did actually stoke more violence and anger and probably was actually inciting um, of violence. So again, that that's a distinction that, that I don't feel either side is, is very persuasive with. Yeah, I mean, this just seems mediocre overall. Right. It's just so, pissing. They're just pissing at each other. Now we get to the now we get to the more interesting part to me. <laughs> so here's the the interesting part of the argument. The last part of section three, as as I read it earlier, discusses Congress's role in this situation. Right. So the last part of uh, se section three, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Fourteenth Amendment says. And I'll requote, but Congress may, by vote of two thirds of each house, remove such disability. And so if you pair that sentence with Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which is even more pivotal, Section 5 is literally one sentence, and it says, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So, Obviously, Section 3 is a part of Amendment 14, right? So Trump side is saying Congress is the only one that can enforce disqualification. This is not a state thing. A state has no jurisdiction or, or power to remove someone from the ballot. This has to be done by Congress. They furthermore point that Section 3 cannot be used to remove uh, a, a candidate from the ballot because the text only forbids insurrectionists from holding office, not running for office or being elected. So here they're contending that it's only after someone's elected to office that Congress then has a duty to decide, is that person actually eligible under this disqualification clause? Section three also leaves open the possibility that Congress could again, as I read, by a two-thirds vote, lift that ban of Section 3 that would otherwise impose after Trump is elected. So long story short here, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment said, and, and 5, as paired with it, says that Congress has the ability to do this, not states. And this gets to some of the consequential stuff that we'll talk about in a minute, but the text of the document actually says 
you can be elected and then Congress has to decide, are you actually qualified to serve in the office? I want to talk about that for a second, though, because I find that more persuasive. I find that argument more, more persuasive, right? So it's this idea that we go through the whole election process and then afterward, if some Democrat contingent of the of Congress wants to say, now we call him up for disqualification, then that sort of triggers something. I find it persuasive, but I don't like it. Are we not, by making that argument, setting up another possible January 6th type event to happen, right? Like, are, are we not opening ourselves up for more circus of, of, of deplorables? Like, are we, are we putting too much power in Congress's hands? I, like this, this opens a lot of wormholes of well, possibilities. This, you want my take on it or what? I, I do. So this thus ends the, the, originalist and textualist arguments that that I wanted to cover. And of course, as I said, this last one I I feel is the most persuasive, but I don't like it. Well, I I think you and I might inhabit slightly different or perhaps more than slightly different uh, opinions on this about constitutionality in general. I think the constitution is only worth what you can do with it. Um, So constitution comes out of a time and a place. So I guess in some ways you could say I'm an, an originalist sort of. But what I'm specifically interested in is the culture that uh, the Constitution comes out of, which is a Anglo-Protestant uh, 1700s culture, which we do not have anymore, um, for better or for worse. I have my opinions about which one of those it is. Um, and I think uh, in – I mean, I, I'm not pleased that people are able to do to, to interpret the uh, Constitution seemingly at will and do it use it for whatever they want to. But that is, in my opinion, now we can disagree. This might be one area where you and I severely disagree. That is clearly the paradigm we live in. And in this paradigm, I think it is politically ridiculous to worry about original, textual originality, originalism, when nobody cares. Um, I think it's far better to be a little bit more expedient, for lack of a better term, and recognize that you have to in order to in order to have the constitution applied and interpreted as you'd like it you have to make that happen the text is not enough so if to oh, i i i actually do agree with you so i want to add some clarification to this though so technically... sorry and by make that happen if i may by make yeah. that happen i mean be willing to use power to do that to force that okay because otherwise, the the people who will who want to be left alone will always be ruled by the people who want to rule. So, so to give like a definition to this, and and perhaps I haven't. And that's done... just me. Sorry, that's just me. That's not Mitch. That's just me. But perhaps I haven't done a good job at this at this previously. But Justice Thomas, who is probably the the quintessential. Uh, conservative jurisprudence uh, I think it's safe follower. to say on this show we are Thomas respectors. I think yes. I think it's safe to say that. Yes. He, he, like he his, his view, his view of 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 making decisions in 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 these cases surrounds an originalist and textualist view. So what we mean by originalism and textualism textualism literally meaning what do the words say, right? But originalism which is part of it goes back to the text history and tradition. So it's that history and tradition part, which is what you were referring to earlier. Well, people forget it. A lot of conservatives jettison the history and tradition and think the text will, quote, speak for itself. Well, thankfully. Thankfully, Justice Thomas and, yeah. and Alito and, and to some regard, Kavanaugh, uh, um, they, they follow this uh, this line of thinking of Kavanaugh is just history and tradition. Kavanaugh likes beer. Okay. That's what I love about Kavanaugh. He likes beer. Uh, let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it, it gets to your point of, of using the, the history and, and the, the background of these people who wrote the document 
and why they wrote it the way that they did. My, my, my point is that ideas come from somewhere, right? Like, yes. and these ideas come from somewhere. And so I think, I mean, again, I think in some ways I... I am probably an originalist, but I am a realist originalist, if we can combine uh, uh, terms together, because the original meanings will only be preserved if people make, you have to make them be preserved. Like they don't just stand on their own. That's not how it works. It never has. It never has, right? No culture has just yeah. persi- has just stood the test of time just because the ideas were quote unquote so good. It's because the ideas were good and there were people who were willing to stand up for good ideas, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Now, but I guess to my original, well, to the the original point, though, of I will, I I said I will buy as persuasive the argument that Congress is the person or is the entity, excuse me, that should uh, execute this disqualification clause from the 14th Amendment. But I don't think I want that. Because Listen to your imagine guy. imagine Listen the your Congress guy. of today having to make that decision and the the cir- the absolute circus it would it would cause. May I ask a question? Yes. Really more of a rhetorical question. You do not okay. have to answer it okay. if you don't want to, but you can if you want to. Is the Constitution the Bible? No. There you go. <laughs> you might find answers in that answer. Maybe that leads you to other conclusions. Possibly. I just, my, my head goes insane with, with as someone who also works in media, uh, you know, writing and, and, and writing for, for news publications, the headlines that, that could come from uh, Congress decides to enact this disqualification clause, how much power that gives a governing body that can't handle the power they already have. Do you, do you think there's a lot of um, accountability in Congress? No. Do you think there's probably more accountability in the office of the president in that there is one person who's the head of it as opposed to a mass entity? And in that, frankly, in that there's term limits. I mean, honestly, uh, there, there's no, there's no holding Congress's feet to the fire because yep. they just keep going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny. I think I'm red pilling you here. I think you're starting to come around. <laughs> I've always been red pilled. <laughs> I, I just, I want, I want Trump's team to win this argument, and it looks like they're going to based off of this again originalist and textualist argument. But I don't ever want to set up that possible future as a thing that might happen yeah you don't want that that would be bad it would in the words of egon spangler it would be bad um but i also don't know i think i'm a little bit more black pill than you are i i don't i hope it turns out for the best i really do i hope and pray you know we pray every 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 sunday for for peace in the land and good order and good governance um we do but um, I I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder if the American system can handle this kind of pressure. It's this wicked thing that we've talked about a lot of times in the show, but it's this wicked problem of a lot of pressure is being exerted upon the system and the system is being hollowed out from the inside. And so you got a lot. You have more weight on top and less structural integrity underneath. Something like that. So. Well. I also, the other reason I think this is the most persuasive argument because the the pushback to this from the other side, uh, from the Anderson side, uh, they pushed back and said that it actually is the the definition of the job of the secretaries of state to decide eligibility of candidates. So they they use things like age, residency, right? We have all of those um, requirements listed out in the Constitution. But the reason that's definitely not a a winnable argument is that, okay, is determining someone's age versus determining that someone has incited an insurrection, are these two comparable things? (laughs) I don't think so. Um, I can look at your birth certificate and say, okay, you are certain age. I cannot look at, at, at 
a, a, an objective document and say, yes, you committed insurrection. Like these are two very not the same things. These are apples and oranges that, that we're putting in the hands of a secretary of state who in some states, as I understand, are not elected, right? Some states they are elected, other states they're appointed. Do we really want that power to go to a secretary of state to be able to say, you're off the ballot? Because I, I say so. You're uneligible. I think the. Uh, I think those of us who are maybe paying slightly more attention, but I would not be. Oh, I, I would it would be interesting to see if even just more normies start noticing normie Americans start noticing that popular sovereignty is not really a thing. With this whole whatever we want to call this crisis. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, do the people have sovereignty in our system? Have they ever had sovereign? Is that even possible for people to have sovereignty? The people? Who are they? I can look to the people in charge. I, I can look to the people making these crucial decisions and say, well, they tend to tend to have sovereignty in this area or in this area, right? But the people... Okay. Well, okay. So maybe, well, maybe the constitution has authority, but the rhetoric seems to be something like the constitution has authority because the people, well, who, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Like who, 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 what, what are we talking about here? It seems a bit like a headless monster running around and no one's really in charge. Everyone's fighting desperately to get in the head position, but it's just sort of this crazy thing, this system that kind of moves largely unaccountably because there is no head. And uh, I think it's been that way for quite some time. This is just me. Mitch is probably going to disagree, but who knows? Uh, and I think we're finally all starting to realize it and go, oh, shit. I don't think anyone's a charge. I think it's like people are fighting for control. Nobody's really defending from a position of power. It's everyone's fighting, scrabbling for that top position. There's nobody there, which is a terrifying prospect to me, at least, because if no one's in charge, what are we doing here? A, a deeper conversation, perhaps. For perhaps. An, well, undoubtedly. Day. But my I guess my point is the, uh, the executive position, the executive branch really hasn't been a thing for a very long time. Not really. And this, this, the sweeping powers of Congress, I think, are are a result of that. I okay, this is me. I do, I do completely disagree with that, and and no, I, I partially disagree with that. But again, I'd rather not dive That's into fine. that part of the. That's fine. I'm teasing you for future episodes, but I, I will. I'm sure I it will come up. Would, again. I told you I'd push back a bit. I I know that and that's exactly what we what what, what we need is you bring is me on for this convers- yes healthy conversation <laughs> um I will say just to to put a pin in in this part of the conversation because I want to jump into this um, last bit the only only way that I will slightly push back on what you're saying is that I think the executive is too powerful because of its unchecked ability to create agencies and we've seen this time and time again i would agree with that to the, a certain the con- extent yes the constitution is supposed the constitution was written to have congress basically be it, they're not co-equal branches of government right congress was supposed to be the the voice of the people and was supposed to be the most powerful branch uh, okay we'll Executive have to do a separate with- a separate episode. I already disagree with you about no, the historicity I, 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 of that, but yeah. <laughs> well, okay. But the executive was supposed to be least less powerful, but the executive has become this behemoth because it has the, it has had the ability to make this agency, that agency, this agency, that is uh, agency. And, and there's a lot of, a lot of legal precedent that again, gets really into the weeds that we can talk about another time. That allows these agencies to kind of go basically, as I said, unchecked and make I, these decisions that affect everyone when no one elected them. I they would were appointed to these positions. I would agree that insofar as and uh, that 
I would say the I agree that the executive branch has taken upon itself to create all these unaccountable agencies, but in so doing has divested itself of power. Okay. Well, that is that is definitely a debate to have uh, at another time because that's that's an interesting take on it that I had not uh, anticipated. Um, but yeah, so it, it it stems off of of a longer discussion. But getting back to the the end of this, that I want to tie this up in a bow. As I've laid out, the textual and the originalist approach to this issue with with Trump and the 14th Amendment. Again, it makes a, a, a good argument, I think, in the, in the long run, an argument that I don't like, but a persuasive one. The other part of the argument, not persuasive at all, like what is a, quote, office or officer of the United States, and, and can we really define that? Not really. So, Can I be one? If we no. can't define it, can I be one? No. Oh. I, I will categorically say no. <laughs> but I want a uniform. <laughs> we can get you a uniform. Can we design a hat? No, no power. Oh. Um, I'll, I'll get you some tinfoil. Yay. <laughs> to get to the other uh, view of this, which is what I really like. There's two ways to call this in, in, in more progressive jurisprudence. Some people on the left call themselves purposivists, which I think is a stupid name and doesn't quite make sense. And Justice Alito very nicely called it consequentialist, which I think is more on the nose and gets to the idea of what we're about to discuss. Well, I will say everyone has consequences. Not everyone has a purpose. Touche. Fair enough. Yes, you're absolutely correct. (laughs) But the idea of consequentialism, meaning any precedent set by the Supreme Court or, or any court for that matter, any any decision made by a court is going to have consequences. And so for justices and judges to think about what the decision they're making will then inspire in the future is is something to weigh. Again, it's a progressive, it's a it's a kind of a leftist jurisprudential frame of work, frame frame of mind, excuse me. So I, I tend not to like it. But in this case, I think it's the best uh, the best way to, to frame this. And a lot of the justices agreed. So in the oral argument, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, he observed that in history, uh, the post-Civil War era, there were, quote, pleth- a plethora of Confederates uh, still present in, in public life. Why did this issue... Of the of the Fourteenth Amendment and and the disqualification clause, why did that never come up? And Justice Kavanaugh added on top of that, well, we had 155 years since then. No state has ever tried to disqualify uh, a candidate or a federal officer from a ballot. No one has ever invoked Section Three because, as Kavanaugh said, "quote There's been a a settled understanding that states don't have that power." This is not a, a state's rights thing. And then to dogpile on top of it, the person you never thought would be coming for this uh, for this stance, Justice Kagan, who I think is one of the most liberal of, of all of them up there, most progressive, I should say. She asked, why why should one state be able to quali- disqualify a candidate from a ballot? And in doing so, effectively determine who becomes president of the United States. Rather than sounding like an issue for an individual state to decide, she said, this quote, sounds awfully national to me. Um, basically, as, as I heard someone break it down, and I, I, I would agree after listening to what she was saying, she was basically saying, why are we taking something that came from the Civil War, which... In, in reality, was a lot about national versus states' rights, right? Like, that was a huge contention there. Why are we taking something that was written to go against states' rights and then give it, use it to, to go back to a states' rights thing? Like, do you see, you see the logic here? Yeah, of- I also can't help but think there's a bit of worry of tit-for-tat happening. 
Of course. Of course. Um, because we all know how competent both who are likely going to become the candidates are, right? We know that both of them are mentally on the same level, right? Oh. With their, so, but maybe some red state gets a crazy idea, right? To like say that somebody who's running isn't mentally capable to run and disqualifies or tries to, right? So maybe there's a fear of tit for tat. That's all I'm saying. Well, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Do I think that Justice Kagan is coming from a a, a point of wanting to help Trump? Absolutely not. Absolutely. No. I'm not stupid enough to think that. No, but, but there's you're a, absolutely right. There's, you there's hear what a, I'm saying, though. There's a consequentialist view of this. Exactly. It's this almost is- like it's almost like some people are aware of the importance of mental faculties when it comes to determining a candidate's like ability to run. But it's also being aware of something past your freaking nose. Yeah. Like so many people and, and you know, as well as I do, I, I, this is where my objective hat comes off and I become more of a, a, a right wing conservative. Most of the left cannot see past their nose and they see this is what I want right now. And they don't think of the consequences you are setting up. So with all of this uh, impeachment stuff that happened for you know under trump you are setting up precedent for us to use your tricks against you and you're going to cry oh you can't do that you can't do that when it's well you did it first you opened up you made the bed you got to lie in it you opened up the can of worms now you got to eat them like uh, how many how many bad metaphors can i use to, <laughs> to describe the situation they cannot see past their own face to to see the consequences of their actions And so thankfully, you know, Justice Kagan, who, again, probably hates Trump, doesn't want him elected, fine. But she knows what this can bring. She knows what this is going to lead to. And probably will vote with conservative justices. I think she. it sounds like she's the rare exception to the TDS folks who really have not progressed. I mean, they have a they have a chronic they just all have chronic cases of TDS. They cannot move past. They're stuck by definition in that frame. Yes. It's and a shame. I, it's a shame our boy Donnie doesn't use that a little bit more to his advantage, but you know, hmm. maybe has some larger game. Who knows? Maybe it's all 40 chess. Maybe who knows? I've heard, I've heard people say that this is either going to be, this is definitely going to be a seven, two decision. It could be eight, one. It could be nine, zero. Oh wow! It, it depends on Sotomayor and uh, um, Jackson. They're they're the two that could go the other way. Um, but still, based on the oral argument and based on the conversation that was had during the oral argument, it's not clear that they're not going to side with Trump on this one either. So it's almost guaranteed this is already decided, and we will have a we should have an opinion uh, within a week, if not two weeks. So we might have a companion episode to this one right after that opinion comes out. Um, and so I might, you know, we might break precedent in our, in our ordering again and give our uh, episode, episode B, episode 0.5 uh, to, to one of these cases before we even finish the other ones. Well, this is the bigger case, I think. I mean, despite the many important cases we covered so far, I'm not diminishing any of those things. Yeah. This is this is important in a way and that is important. temporally constrained, let's say. Yes. Yeah. So definitely worth giving uh priority to. I will I I will turn off my OCD and break break protocol and break order for just a minute <laughs> to give the people what they want. Well, and then we'll, we'll 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 pump you full of Prozac and just set you back down on the couch, and you'll just feel better afterwards. Not <sighs> what they do in I'll, LA. I'll, I'll get over it. I'll get over it. All right. But yeah, so you'll you'll hear you'll hear more about this one very very soon from us. But as of now, case dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>